Good morning, and welcome to Let's Talk Real Estate on 101.5 Sports Radio, Lakes Region. Today's show is presented by the Cisneros Realty Group, powered by EXP Realty, and sponsored by Dana Gunnarsson, agent at the Joe Suazo Allstate Insurance Office, Hudkins Law, Title, and Settlement, and NCT, Nano Coding Technologies. It's time to join our host at Let's Talk Real Estate. And good Saturday morning. My name is Karina Cisneros, Realtor with the Cisneros Realty Group, powered by EXP Realty. We cover the New Hampshire Lakes region from Concord to Franconia. Our show focuses on all aspects of real estate. And in the next 30 minutes, we'll share with you important information that will help you with either buying or selling your home. Today, a very special guest, George LeMay, Certified General Appraiser, specializing in eminent domain. Welcome, George. Good morning. How are you? (laughs) Good morning. Okay, George. um, Appraising or appraisal for me as a realtor is is a mystery. Okay. Um, It's very specialized, uh, and banks, of course, and other uh, and private individuals or companies, or even the state in your case, needs your services yes. to calculate the value of a piece of property. Yes. Okay? And many times, we as owners think our property is worth much higher than it actually may be worth according to the needs of a bank uh, to finance, et cetera, correct? That's correct, yes. It has to do with perspective. Okay, explain that, please. An appraiser's job is to not take part in the transaction. They're not buying it. They're not selling it. They have no interest in the property. In essence, they're paid to not care. Okay. That way, they can look at data, hopefully objectively, Mm -hmm. and see what a sound value is what the data suggests rather than knowing so much about the property and wanting a high number or wanting a low number if you're buying and give an accurate readout. George, I understand there are three ways that properties can be appraised, three methods. Is that true? Yes. What are they, please? Uh, The most common methods are uh, what what some folks refer to as a sales comparison approach the income approach, and the cost approach to value. And there are three different ways of looking at a property based on the typical buyer for a property. If you had an apartment building, you would not expect to live in it. And so the desire to own it, which would determine how much you'd be willing to pay for it, it's a different set of amenities, which are the different attributes that people are actually paying for. Um, and the other approach? That would, you would use, typically in that, you would use the uh, income approach. And the cost approach? The cost approach is usually most applicable for new construction or when there's a lot of land around but not much inventory. And someone would consider purchasing a lot, going through the exercise and the delay of putting up what they wanted. And it models that behavior. And the first approach, or the most common approach, is the sales comparison approach. That is something that everybody can relate to because we do it every day. Mm -hmm. We look at other things and we say, well, if I can buy this for $4, why should I pay $6? Mm -hmm. I'll just go get something else. And it deals with the idea of value and exchange. If you're car shopping, it's very easy to figure out how much you should pay. Okay, so for example, as a realtor in today's market, I'm seeing properties that come on the market, I call my buyers, this came on the market, come see it as soon as you can, and then they're under agreement before they even have a chance to come up and see it. Yes. Or, okay, so, and they're going for multiple offers, and of course, uh, that means higher than the asking. In a situation like this, how does an appraiser fairly, as an appraiser account for the fact that 
the market's so tight, the comps may be at a lower level, but now we have a new market going on and then properties are going for much higher. What happens then? Well, there's when I got when I originally got into appraising, we were right before what is known as the SNL crisis. Yes. And uh, when my, was that? 1930. That. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. 1812, I think. Oh. <laughs> my boys have asked me if I had a dinosaur for a pet. Okay. And they weren't kidding. They <laughs> thought that was the case. Um, you know, in that at that point in time, we were seeing uh, appreciation rates in the order of two percent a month. Wow. It was insanity, and that was when I first got started. And when I, my first couple of appraisals, I was very concerned because um, I was coming up with numbers that they looked awful high to me. And when I asked some of the older appraisers that had been at it for a while, they said, don't worry about it. If it's high, don't worry about it because if you're not right this week, next week you will be. Wow. And that was what the tenor was. And it continued like that for probably six months. And then the bottom fell out. And the market went in the other direction, and things got very quiet. But we're addressing your question, how do we account for that? One of the things that appraisers do is we look at a lot of different information. We don't just look at sales. We'll look at listings. We'll look at what the supply and demand is. We'll look at where the trend has been going. And as you said, uh, right now, especially coming out of the winter, in the middle of winter, there's very little inventory. Mm -hmm. And if you have a number of buyers, mm -hmm. that is going to tend to drive things up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a seasonal fluctuation. But we're also coming into a time when the market has been warm a long enough time where it started to push things. Now, appraisers will take and they'll look at that trend and they'll say, okay, this is going up. And they have a couple of different tools in their toolbox. One of them would be, uh, and this is the most valuable one, would be to contact the realtors in the area and find out what's going on at these closings. Mm -hmm. In the MLS, as you know, you have information regarding the original list price yes. and the selling price. And we do what's called a CMA, uh, Comparative Market Analysis. But that's way, way before the appraisers come in after the contract. That's right. Okay, hold that thought. We need to take a break and hear from our sponsors. My name is Karina Cisneros, and you're listening to Let's Talk Real Estate on 101.5 Sports Radio Lakes Region. Another summer day has come and gone away. In Paris and Rome, but I want to go home. This is Let's Talk Real Estate with Karina Cisneros on 101.5 WEEI Sports Radio Lakes Region. Once again, here's Karina. And we are back with George LeMay, Certified General Appraiser. Um, I want to switch gears a bit. Um, you're not the usual appraiser that I talk to as a realtor who does residential homes. Your expertise is an eminent domain. Yes. So... You probably work for the state, right, for a long mm -hmm. time, and you're retired. Yes. So what exactly is eminent domain? When property is needed to be uh, acquired for a public good, for example, maybe they're changing an intersection and they have to widen the road an extra two and a half feet. Well, that two and a half feet has to come from somewhere, and typically it's at a budding private property owner. And there is this little clause in our Constitution that says private property cannot be taken without just compensation. Mm -hmm. So they need someone to figure out how much is that property worth that is being and acquired. And that's where you come in. That's where we come in. Okay, now. Exactly. So tell us a story of maybe once upon a time where some street or road actually had to go through a, a home. Okay. Or a... How does that work, and, and what, what are the record? I mean, can the property owner say, no, I'm not going to move? All right. Uh, I, I can think of once upon a real time. Yes. Uh, most, most folks will be familiar with 93 as it goes up through the notch. Yes. Um, and 89 as it heads out through the upper valley. Yes. 
Well, where, nine, where 89, I-89 crosses over into Vermont, that whole area, which is West Lebanon, used to be a farm. That farm uh, ended up being split up because the highway went through the middle of it. The theory is that if that property owner said, no, I do not want to sell my property, then the rest of the state would suffer. And the Constitution recognizes that the sovereign, which is a word that we're almost allergic to, right. the authority that we all live in, mm -hmm. has the right to take any property that a private citizen must have. Now, what if, have. what if the value that you as an eminent domain appraiser says it's worth, thus the owner says, no, I want more for my property. Okay. That's an easy one. They, they cannot stop the project. They will not stop the betterment because that's for the public good. Uh, what will happen will be the, and this sounds terrible, but the property will be acquired and we, an offer will be tendered and the monies that the state has said or the appraiser has indicated this is fair will be available to that owner. They can take it immediately, even if they don't agree with the amount. Without what they call prejudice or nothing against them, they can then go for a hearing and they can appeal the decision. Then the, they appear before typically the Board of Tax and Land Appeals and they'll often bring their own appraisal in, showing what they figure it's worth. And the discussion will go and it will be adjudicated. But the reason why it's allowed to go forward anyway before that's settled is because the expense for holding it up would be so high relative to the amount, it can't be done. So here's a question. Yeah. What would happen if the lien on that property is actually higher than what you, the appraiser, says it's worth. All right. That, that has happened, and that usually happens in a declining market. There, I won't get into all the subtleties because there's a lot of different things that can happen. The typical one that will happen is the property owner will be paid for whatever their equity portion. In this instance, there would be zero. They are actually in a liability position. Correct. But the the liens will be paid off by the they have to be paid off by the sovereign by the sovereign the sovereign has to clear those because those are legal legal encumbrances against that property and the sovereign must have so, clear title so in this case if that's the case then the property owner would probably tell you come on in yeah. buy my property mm -hmm. give me zero equity because you're I, gonna get stuck with a big bill that that i'm not gonna have to pay right Really? Right. That happens. That wow. does happen. doesn't happen very often. Right. Um, because, of course, the lenders are careful not to get in that position, typically. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not a good thing. Okay. Uh, what are the chances that today in New Hampshire somebody can be eminent domained out of their property right now? <laughs> um, Is it happening somewhere? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. It, it happens. Does it, it happen happens every day? Almost? I'm not going to say every day. Typically, eminent... Eminent domain is the right to take the property. Yeah. Condemnation is the act of taking it. Okay. All right? Okay. And when it reaches that stage, a lot of effort has gone by to negotiate yeah. an acceptable settlement already. So it's going to happen no matter what. The sovereign is always going to get what the, they need yes. for the benefit of the public. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And how did you get involved in this particular sliver <laughs> of appraising? My background is mechanical engineering. Oh, okay. And uh, I compared notes with my brother who was an appraiser after we had both been in our respective professions, and he was making five times what I was, and he was living in a much better area, and I don't like the cities. <laughs> and I said, I'll come work for you, bro. <laughs> of A course. After I, after I cut my teeth there, yeah. I realized that I didn't care for, and I wasn't really cut out because of the analysis that I put in yeah. for the lending world. Yeah. Um, I already had my license at that point, but an opening came up at the state. From yep. my brother's background there prior, he said I would be a good fit, and I went in and I found out their concern is not time. It is accuracy okay. and support. Okay, George, we only have yes. about one more minute left. Okay. Give us a quick 
story or anecdote of an experience you had while doing your work with the state that made you happy or sad? There were two property owners. They, uh, one had frontage on a road and the other one didn't. They were elderly, or yes, they were both elderly. There was an expansion going of, a, of the highway. Both of these small properties would be wiped out. And as it happened, the first, the first property I did was the one behind the other one. I had a front property and a rear property. Did the one in the behind. Unfortunately, I could not find any access to it. It was landlocked. She, she swore up and down she had access. I couldn't find it. She couldn't give me any hints. We settled on that for very little money. And then I went to the one with the frontage. And he, we were going along fine with that one until the first one said, if I don't have access, he doesn't have access. And when I did the second one, we discovered that his property had this agreement where his access was conditioned on a piece going through to give an access to the rear. So did that make you happy? It made me miserable. Oh, why? Because these two people would not talk to each other. These two neighbors were so busy trying to get every nickel out of these lots mm -hmm. that they wouldn't provide access to each other. Oh. And there was nothing I could do because it's not my position to be saying, listen, you two need to talk together and you need to do this and you need to do that so I can give you more money. I couldn't do it and it made me miserable. All right, well, thank you for sharing this um <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of our audience george lemay i will not give you his phone number or email he is retired and does not want to be contacted <laughs> but <laughs> george will you still come on the show once in a while maybe to educate us and illuminate us of the finer points of <laughs> appraising anytime oh thank you so much george oh one last thing you do have a real estate school right Yes, LeMay School of Real Estate. And what do you teach there? I do recertification classes for appraisers. Okay, good. So if you're an appraiser out there, you probably already know George LeMay because he's known everywhere in the state. Uh, call him for some uh, continuing education or recertification. Yes. All right. This thank is you. Karina Cisneros, and thank you so much, George. <laughs> thank you.